The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man, handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside of the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in his power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. The word of the Lord.
first letter of Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was raised from the dead, bones and all. The Easter season, perhaps uniquely amongst our liturgical year, invites us to consider this question. And boy, oh boy, on the top ten list of statements you don't want to ask at a cocktail party, that's probably on there. <laughs> We Episcopalians don't like to ruffle feathers or make people feel uncomfortable, so we're not likely to lead with this one, even when we're acting evangelistically. (laughs) Do we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, bones and all? You know, my children are astonished to learn that I had a life before them, Um, but I did. And um, actually, when I was uh, in my 20s and a college student, that was the first time in my life that I was beginning to feel the stirrings of a sense of call to some sort of ministry in the church. I mean, I was raised in Episcopalian, cradle Episcopalian. I mean, I certainly knew enough to know not to ask that question. Um, But... But I was always suffused, especially in those early years of feeling the stirrings of the Spirit in me, I was always suffused by the season of Easter. There was something about the the dramatic power of Holy Week propelling into the Easter proclamation that stirred my soul deeply. But I had, you know, many friends in my life, many acquaintances, some very close friends in my life, who were not of the same ilk, were not feeling the same stirrings of the spirit, were not, quite frankly, particularly spiritual or religiously interested in all. And one in particular in my life in those early, early years, in my early 20s, um, she was very tolerant of my, my curiosities with faith. But at one point, I remember the conversation did become rather pointed. And she looked at me and she said, so, um, and this was around the Easter season too, as I recall, when I was probably rather insufferable. And she said, so, raised from the dead. And I said, yeah. She said, literally a dead body got up and walked around. And I said, yep. And she said, you're okay with this. And in retrospect, as I recall it, this was the window. This was the opening that we desperately look for, we people of faith look for, when we can just ever so slightly crack the door open and commend the faith that is in us and possibly even bring somebody to faith, bring somebody to, to, a, to an understanding of the risen Christ. And I probably looked at her and said, yeah. 
<laughs> and then we moved on to something else. <laughs> oh well. Hope springs eternal. But here we are in the church, nevertheless. 20, 25 plus years later for me, perhaps longer for some of you, 2,000 years plus later for the church, sitting squarely with this question, was Jesus really raised from the dead, bones and all? Now, I think we've sat with that question long enough, and I'm artfully going to put it over here in the corner for a moment and invite us to consider the question that I I think the church is asked this morning, which I hope is perhaps a deeper question and perhaps a more relevant question, quite frankly. Because if we're honest, the gospel witness is full of resurrections. The first century was lousy with resurrections. Perhaps you recall just a few weeks before Holy Week, we had Lazarus raised from the dead. If we were going through a liturgical cycle where we had a different gospel that we were reading, we'd hear about Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. If we were going through the liturgical season where we were reading Matthew's gospel, we would have learned about that resurrection from the dead of all the righteous who died at Jesus' crucifixion. Remember that story? We don't dwell on that one too much. Must have been an odd day in Jerusalem. <laughs> So I don't think the question, was Jesus raised from the dead, bones and all, is quite the point. The question we're invited to consider today, you and me, is, was Jesus raised from the dead, wounds and all? Wounds and all. On Good Friday, the church is presented with what I think is the sort of foundational paradox of faith, which is how can a God who is all good and all knowing and all powerful permit suffering? How can a God who is all good and all powerful and all knowing permit evil? On Good Friday, it is particularly poignant because we stand at the foot of the cross. God, God's self, suffering. And I would like to suggest a possible response to the conundrum. Respectfully. <laughs> Maybe God is not all-powerful. <laughs> but hear me out. Maybe God is not all-powerful in the way we understand power. In the way even that the church has come to teach Power. Maybe Jesus' wounds are a clue. The disciples, those days and weeks following the resurrection, were terrified and scattered, hiding in the upper room, not plotting their next move. We cannot think of this in some sort of retrospective way as the great triumph that they always knew was coming and they're up there in that upper room planning out church dogma. The disciples were convinced that they were next. The disciples were convinced that they would be killed. That they were headed to the cross just like Jesus and they were scared. They were wounded. In modern psychoanalytical parlance, 
they were suffering from some significant post-traumatic stress. Now, we need to remember that part of the mission of Jesus, we have come to understand in scholarship and in study and in history and in theology, was this idea that the disciples had, that St. Paul certainly had, that Jesus himself probably had, which was that they were at the end of the age. The new creation, the new kingdom was imminent and that it was going to begin with the resurrection of the dead. They were expecting that, but it didn't happen, at least not the way they thought it would happen. Their Lord and Master was killed brutally and senselessly, and this could not have been what they had in mind. And they were beginning, I think, to come to terms with what it would mean to be not at the end of the age, but at the beginning of something. At the beginning of a new creation. Not in the way that they had thought it would be, but something entirely new. In other words, they could understand what it would be like to die for Jesus, but they had no clue how to live for Jesus. And that awareness dawned on them in this resurrection moment. That awareness emerged like the rising sun warming their face and they began to see that the suffering undergone by Jesus, that the suffering that would be undergone by them, by Thomas, by anyone who has proclaimed Christ crucified and raised was the clue to God's power. God's power, you see, is found not in power, but in powerlessness. God resides not with the lofty, but with the lowly. God can be found in the disinherited, the disenfranchised, the disempowered. God's wounds shown to Thomas are our wounds and it is in the binding of the wounds, it is in the caring for the wounded that the church finds its meaning. Now this sense of power in powerlessness, that changed everything. That changed everything. It's not that God is ambivalent about our suffering. It's not that God even requires our suffering. It is that God suffered too. There is no realm of our experience, no darkness that God has not entered. What do we say in the creed? Every week, he descended to the dead. Jesus' first salvific act of the new creation was to go to the dead and say, you too, you too. Now that's good news. So, we, like Thomas, seek, we search, we ask questions, we even make demands on God, and God will meet us where we are if we have the grace and the courage to see it. And that is good news.
So with the first disciples, when we are terrified in the upper room, hiding, because we are convinced we have no place left to go, that we have reached the end of the line, that we too will be foisted up on our cross sooner or later. Let us take heart. Let us remember that we have had one who has gone before and shown us the way. And let us finally, with Thomas, come into the presence of the creator of all that is, the one who desires for us fullness of life, the one who has known us before we were born, the one who has loved us from the foundation of creation, and say, my Lord and my God. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 358. We believe in one God. in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. We pray for our companion parish, St. John's Belfont. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Trinity Episcopal Pro Cathedral, Williamsport. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Church of Tanzania. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified by all people. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Michael, Presiding Bishop, Audrey, Bishop, Jeffrey and Ted, priests, Joe, Deacon, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your words and sacraments. We pray for Joseph, our president, Josh, our governor, and all our elected, appointed leaders, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That they may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works be find favor in your sight. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we all come and share in that Let us pray for our own needs and those of others.
pray for the repose of the soul of Roger Palmer. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Sunday to me. <laughs> you all get extra points for coming to church, by the way, the Sunday after Easter. That's extra special. You know, as I was reflecting on the idea of our wounds, I was trying to remember the term, and I didn't say it because I couldn't remember the term, but what is the term for that artisanal practice in Japanese pottery for gilding uh, damaged, what is the term? Say it, say it louder. Yes, that's exactly right. So the idea is the broken, the broken pottery is repaired with a beautiful sort of gilded repair, you know, gold, silver, so that you see the, the, the blemish, you see the crack, you see the repair. The idea that, that we carry our wounds with us and that they are even part of our story and part of our beauty. So I couldn't remember the term, so I didn't say it. So thank you. What is <laughs> thank you. We couldn't hear back. We couldn't hear back. You. What is the practice? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have Roger Balmer's uh, service uh, in celebration of his life this Tuesday. Uh, we encourage you to come. It's at one one thirty in the afternoon. Uh, other things going on. Please uh, our, welcome our greeter, John. And uh, let me welcome him. And if you're new, uh, no matter where you are, if you're in a broken place or if you're in a broken place or somewhere in between, you can find here what you're looking for. And so welcome, whether you're new or not. And if you are new, if you would fill out this blue card that's in front of you in your queue, and give it to me on the way out. There's lots going on. I commend uh, our parish bulletin to you. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Paige. One thing got in today's bulletin is um, the upcoming spring cleanup day that I'm leading on April, Saturday, April 29th. Uh, at this moment, I have five volunteers that I know of. And I encourage you to, to talk to me after service today.
Anything else? Well, again, delighted you're here. Uh, if, you're, if you are visiting, uh, we receive communion coming down the center aisle. Just follow the, uh, follow the, follow the crowd and you won't go wrong. And, and you are certainly welcome to come forward. Even if you do not wish to receive the sacrament, you are certainly welcome to come forward to receive a blessing. So, ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts with praise. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Thanksgiving continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, beginning on page 361 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ is Lord. Amen. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Christ for the better heaven. Body of Christ.
the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has bought, brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God, Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Fuck.